Welcome to Grace Lutheran Church in River Forest, Illinois for this service of evening prayer. It is good to be gathered together in worship, even while we are far apart from one another physically. We know, especially during this Easter tide, this Easter season, that we are together in Christ and that we dwell with the God who dwells with us together. This is the final Bach Cantata Vespers of this 49th year of this ministry. This is usually the occasion when we say thank you, and we will do that still today. We say thank you to all of our musicians and homilists who have blessed us with their God-given talents during this year. We say thank you particularly to Pastor Michael Costello for his unparalleled leadership of this ministry and for, for the faithfulness with which he guides us. I want to thank each of you as well. Thank you for your presence and uh, attendance when we are able to do these worship services together. Thank you for your prayer and for your ongoing financial support of this ministry that we share and offer to God's glory. Next year will be our 50th year of Bach Cantata Vespers here at Grace Lutheran Church, and we have a wonderful year planned. Of course, as events continue to unfold, we cannot say what the future holds or when we will be able to be together again, but we look forward to that day. And even while we are apart, it is all the more reason uh, to sing our praises and offer our prayers to the God who is with us, to Jesus Christ, who is risen from the dead. Worship begins with the service of light. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. We are illumined by the brightness of his rising. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Death has no more dominion over us. Alleluia. Joyous light of glory, of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who led your people Israel by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Enlighten our darkness by the light of your Christ. May his word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. For you are merciful and you love your whole creation and we, your creatures, glorify you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
Let the incense of our repentant prayer ascend before you, O Lord, and let your loving kindness descend upon us, that with purified minds we may sing your praises with the church on earth and the whole heavenly host, and may glorify you forever and ever. Amen. Amen.
A reading from Romans. St. Paul writes, So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If in fact we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from Matthew. Jesus said to his disciples, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorns or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many deeds of power in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Go away from me, you evildoers. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When the Bach Cantata schedule for this year was arranged last spring and summer, who would have thought we would be where we are now in the middle of a pandemic that has taken more lives of Americans than died in Vietnam, that we would be shut into our homes, some even shut into their rooms, unable to gather for worship, unable to gather for work, for class, for celebrations, for even a chat with friends. From today's cantata are these words. For those who hope in Jesus, the door of mercy stands always open. And if cross and tribulation crush, crush them, they will be refreshed with comfort. Who would have thought that a text that includes these words would be so completely and highly relevant in a brand new way during these coronavirus times. Likewise, today's text from Romans, the spirit you have received is not a spirit of slavery leading you back into a life of fear, but a spirit of adoption, enabling us to cry, Abba, Father. We are God's children, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ but we must share his sufferings if we are also to share his glory. Paul is writing in the context of what he knew about Roman adoption, which was a complicated, difficult legal process. But the result of Roman adoption was that the former life of the one being adopted was completely erased, including all debts, and this person entered a new life. So too, this spiritual adoption leads us to a new life. It leads us to new families where Christ is our brother and we are brothers and sisters to each other. 
And in this family of believers in the risen Lord, we share Christ's glory and also his sufferings. The glory is not ours alone. We claim it only through Christ. And the suffering we endure is not endured alone. It is also Christ's, who, Paul assures us, lifts us out of a life of fear into a life of abundant love. Mark Oakley is a poet and a Church of England priest. He tells of an experience he had visiting Dresden, Germany, which over three days in February 1945, the Allies had bombed so relentlessly that the city was decimated and 25,000 people died. Mark Oakley's grandfather, who raised him, had been a British airman in that battle, and he was profoundly touched by it for the rest of his life. In his adulthood, Mark Oakley was invited to visit Dresden, and he was eager to do so. He took a cab from the airport to his hotel, and on the way, the driver asked him what brought him to the city. Oakley said to him, they had always wanted to visit Dresden. The cab driver asked why. And Oakley mentioned that his grandfather had fought in the siege of Dresden. The cab driver pulled over to the side of the road and turned around. He said, my mother was killed in that battle. And there was silence. Oakley sat startled and wondered what he should do or say. Then the cab driver reached over the seat and shook Oakley's hand. He said, this is a moment we will remember for the rest of our lives. The horrors and the suffering of the cab driver's family and the loss of his mother were not erased, of course, but the cab driver recognized his kinship with Oakley and his forgiveness made them now members of the same family. The handshake was an act of love. Several decades before, they would have been mortal enemies. Our text today speaks of another enemy. Christ calls them false prophets. He says they are wolves in disguise as sheep, those who seem to speak in his name but whose actions betray their true motives. We see them at work every day. How do we recognize them, we ask? Christ says, by their fruit, by their actions, and by the results of their actions. The cantata picks up the imagery of false prophets in a surprising and original way. Beware, we hear, of reason when it leads us to false but almost irresistible conclusions about God's powerlessness and absence. Now this is perhaps Bach's protest against the forces of the Enlightenment, that intellectual and philosophical movement of the 18th century that emphasized reason and skepticism about God's involvement with the world. But even Luther, two centuries earlier, provided a strong admonition in this regard. He writes, reason holds that if God had a watchful eye on us and loved us, he would prevent all evil and let us suffer nothing. But now since all sorts of calamities come to us, it concludes either God has forgotten me or God is hostile to me and does not want me. Otherwise, he would help me and would not permit me to lie here and to struggle in such misery. Several decades after Luther, John Donne wrote his famous sonnet, Batter My Heart, Three-Personed God, in which he complains to God that reason, your viceroy in me, me should defend, but is captived and proves weak or untrue. A viceroy is a person delegated by the king to act as an authority. So, Dunn says, 
Reason is God's viceroy in us. God has given us reason as a guide, but reason, while God-given, often betrays us, leads us to faulty conclusions, does not lead us to the truth. Reason, in fact, often leads us astray and frequently leads us to doubt. We wonder where God is in all of this, why he lets this happen. It is the big why that wants an answer, some way of understanding why we are doomed to live in a world where death and illness and suffering seem rampant. In the words of today's opening chorale, where the Lord God does not abide with us, if our enemies rage and he does not support our cause in heaven high above, where he does not protect Israel and breaks not the enemy's tricks, then all is lost for us. There is no answer for this why that reason can provide. I have recently discovered a beautiful story by an author I did not know, even though he wrote for decades and died only last year. His name is John LaRue. In his story, The Expert on God, he describes a priest who struggles with his faith because he realizes that it is not reasonable. He was ordained, but he had been filled with doubt since he was a child, wondering how it was that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit were not three separate gods. As he matured in his ministry, he had other doubts. I quote now from the story. He doubted Christ's presence in the Eucharist. He prayed for faith, and some kind of faith came to him because he left off doubting about the Eucharist and moved on to doubt other matters, the virginity of Mary, the divinity of Christ, and then later the humanity of Christ. At one time or another, he doubted every article of belief, but only for a while, and only one at a time. In the end, he doubted the love of God, and that doubt did not pass. And then one Christmas day, the streets slick with snow, hail, and freezing rain. On his way home after saying Mass, this doubting Thomas suddenly saw one car on its side, three stunned boys standing beside it, and another car recently crumpled nearly in two. He pulled his car over and made his way through the snow to the car with its demolished front end. The three boys from the other car seemed stunned but okay. He determined that there was a person inside the flipped over car, unconscious and wedged under the dashboard. When he tried to open the battered door, it wouldn't budge. He tried the other door, and in his desperation, LaRue writes, he braced his back against the side of the car, pushing outward on the broken door and twisting half crazy until the hinge gave way. What he found inside was a boy, and he wrenched the crumpled dashboard away and heaved the boy to the seat. It was a boy, LaRue writes, in his new car, and he was still alive or nearly. He made a sound that might have been a sigh or a groan. Blood trickled from his mouth, but he did not die. The priest pulled his vial of holy oil from his pocket and anointed this boy in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, absolving the boy from all of his sin, and then he waited. Something had to happen. All he heard was silence and the erratic, choking breathing of the boy. He said the Lord's Prayer and other rote prayers and asked himself, what could he do? What could he say at such a moment? What would God do at such a moment if there were a God? What could anyone say to this crushed, dying thing, he wondered? What would God say if he cared as much as I? 
Blood began to pour from the boy's mouth, and at once the priest, whom the author calls faithless and unrepentant, bent over the boy and whispered, I love you. Over and over again, he said, I love you, I love you, I love you. This man of God was a person of faith and doubt and contradiction, as are we all. But notice what he does and what he says. You will recognize them by their fruit, Christ says. And the fruit we see in this priest's unhesitating action, even in the face of this child's certain death, even though he knew he could do nothing to save him, and that even the words of the prayers he had memorized and the rituals of the church he had ministered seemed weak and futile. And then in a flash, he recognizes that it is Christ's love that is more important than anything. And that is what he offers this dying boy. And through Christ, he offers him his own love. The final tenor aria of the cantata is a cry of triumph. Be silent, just be silent, stumbling reason. Do not say the devout are lost. The cross has given them new life. For to those who hope in Jesus, the door of mercy stands always open. And the final chorale is a plea. Our enemies are all in your hand, along with all their thoughts. These enemies, false prophets, doubt, disease, death, lead only to darkness and separation if we allow them to have the final word. Instead, the chorale continues. Their attacks are known to you, Lord. Help us so we do not waver. Let your light become bright for us and let our hearts be ignited. And then the final wonderful line, let the world murmur forever. That noise, that drone of complaint and doubt and fear provides background noise in our lives, sometimes so loud that it is difficult for us to hear anything else. Sometimes it is a murmur. Sometimes these days it is a grumble. But God is constant to the end. And in response, how should we then live? Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For you know that in the Lord... Your labor is not in vain. Amen.
In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. But now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all pastors and teachers in Christ, for all servants of the church, and for all the people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our public servants, for the government and those who protect us, that they may be upheld and strengthened in every good deed, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who work to bring peace, justice, health and protection in this and every place. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who bring offerings, those who do good works in this congregation, those who toil, those who sing, and all the people here present who await from the Lord great and abundant mercy, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For favorable weather, for an abundance of the fruits of the earth, and for peaceful times, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our deliverance from all affliction, wrath, 
danger and need, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the faithful who have gone before us and are at rest, let us give thanks to the Lord. Alleluia. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Rejoicing in the fellowship of all the saints, let us commend ourselves, one another, and our whole life to Christ our Lord. To you, O Lord. O God, from whom come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works, give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness. Through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, God forever. Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our, our Father, who, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless and preserve you.